And the project for science will be to figure out how it all works, you know, how it puts together all the mechanisms, how to in interpret it. Now, the reason why that approach isn't taken, I think, is because uh, it suggests the existence of something outside of science, which is the source of that, that uh, information, and that's unacceptable. When you, when you hear the language that the molecular biologists use, they talk, you know, about the, the information which is stored in libraries of uh, DNA and which transpo is transposed and coded and decoded and translated. They use all the language of intelligent communication, but they run away from the metaphysics. Now, it's not a matter of speculating about myths and so on. It's a matter of looking at what's there and not being afraid to see it because it leads you to disturbing conclusions okay, about other okay, things. Okay, well then, again, what I say is, yeah, why does the evidence... Okay. Oh, I have a question for John. Yeah, we're going to be alternating. This is a design. Not could I uh, actually? Could I speak to Dr. Proline? Because I, then, I'm afraid that every, the, all the questions to one spirit come from one side and then from the other. Yeah. yeah. So I think I was next. My question to Dr. Provine is, with your permission, moderator. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't hear what he said. My my question to Professor Provine is. You've mentioned uh, evolution from pre-existing uh, species, and I would wonder how you would, or how science would explain the creation of the first species, because it seems to me that if you take, you know, the building blocks, let's say, you know, 20 amino acids and four base pairs and some lipids and things, if you built, built everything together and, and molded it to be exactly what a paramecium is, would it still necessarily be alive? Do you follow what I'm saying? There yeah, like there's something I follow more. what so, you're saying. You're asking where did the first life come from, and you're suggesting that the first life was like a paramecium. No, no, uh, I'm saying I, what was the first? What was the first life? What was the first thing that was alive? How would? How do you? Gosh, uh, no, I, I wasn't there at the time, but let, <laughs> let, let me let me really try and address what you're asking. You want to know how there could be a naturalistic evolution of life on Earth? Fifteen years ago, it looked like there was not a good answer to that. Because DNA-based life requires all kinds of enzymes, both for replication of the DNA and turning DNA into proteins. And it did not appear that all that system could have been available in time for the DNA-based life to evolve and everything to work. At the time that we thought DNA-based life had to have evolved from inanimate matter, a number of very prominent prebiotic biologists including Francis Crick for a while, argued that the first life must have come to Earth from outer space because they felt very frustrated. But since that time, we've discovered that RNA can in fact, through reverse transcriptase, turn back into DNA. And now there are very plausible scenarios for the evolution of RNA-based life, particularly nice because RNA can both catalyze itself and replicate itself and turn into uh, protein. I just heard a scenario presented at a molecular evolution in Costa Rica of a young man who was arguing for a particular scenario, admittedly very theoretical, but plausible nevertheless, for the transference of RNA life into DNA life. It's a really exciting time on the origin of life issue and you're, you're asking your question at just the right time. There are a lot of people on this campus that could give you some really detailed information and answers to your questions. But let me, let me perhaps clarify. I, even in the RNA uh, world scenario, there's still at some point this living thing that has this code, and, I, and it evolved from no code, and I'm trying to see where that, that's what's exactly, the there. That's exactly the issue that terribly interests evolutionary biologists and that's what I'm telling you is a real good hot issue right now. Evolutionists are thinking a lot about that question. I don't know exactly how RNA evolved in the first place, but as I say, it's a real lively field of evolutionary biology right now. Thank you. I'll just comment that these scenarios seem uh, plausible to those that are already convinced of the basic naturalistic uh, uh, scenario. They change all the time. You get proteins first in one time, and then it's uh, RNA. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, 
uh, the comments from leading people in the field have often indicated that there's an amazing failure of any experimental success. We have mutually inconsistent paradigms fighting each other, um, and uh, uh, the field is, is uh, still at a pre, almost a pre-paradigmatic stage. Now, one of my most distinguished colleagues at Berkeley, a very famous uh, molecular biologist I won't name, said to me once, he said, Phil, he says, I read your book. And it seems, uh, uh, con uh, you know, I've, I'm convinced that Darwinian evolution is okay up from the cell, he says, the cell on up, but you can't get a cell that way, I know that. And I said to my friend, well, X, do you realize that the cell is the only thing you know about? Um, that is to say that he had studied professionally. Um, these scenarios seem plausible if you already buy the philosophical necessity. Okay, we're, we're back to Professor Johnson. Um, Professor Johnson. I think you do a good job proving that there's holes in evolutionary the theory, questions that are still being asked, and you know, dissent that's still happening among you know, far-looking researchers. However, a lot of the researchers that you're probably citing have faith that the answers to these questions lie in the evolutionary theory in you know, areas that Darwin may not have seen, but you know, still see the answers as lying along that track. Why do your questions, why did the holes that you state go to prove any alternative evolutionary theory more than, hmm. I mean, how do they at all support yeah. creationism as opposed to a revisionist evolutionary theory? She's asking you to fill in the blank yeah, of sure. the mechanism of evolution. Well, why should I even be interested in doing that? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, what you're asking is for me, blank, to, blank, is for me to, to join the other side and become a promoter of some half-baked naturalistic scenario for the history of life. Whereas my whole point is to tell you that these are half-baked scenarios and I don't believe any of them. Uh, what, uh, 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 see, this, this idea, you're supposed to promote a naturalistic alternative and be in our business, otherwise you have no standing, that's what keeps this system from crumbling of its own accord is because of, of rules like that um, and then it's promoted to the public as the creation story um, that everybody's supposed to believe and found their ethics on. But you Why should we? But you state that there's a lack of empiricism in evolutionary theory, that there's some, you know, there are questions left, on, you know, questions that still need to be answered and stuff like that, but you don't have any empirical evidence that creationism is true. Well, what do we mean by creationism? There's loads of empirical evidence that there is, <laughs> sure. Richard Dawkins begins his book, The Blind Watchmaker, the most vociferous argument for atheism in the guise of bi biology that you can find, by saying that living organ biology is the study of extremely complicated things that look as if they were designed by a creator for a purpose. Uh, and in particular, he, go, he goes on to concede that even a, a single cell contains genetic information that exceeds the information content of all the volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, put together, or a CD-ROM, or whatever you, you, you want, want to say. Now then he says that's an illusion because we know that mutation and selection can do the whole job. But if you look at the evidence and you see how much that's just assumption and presumption, and it's downright against the evidence of the fossil record, and it isn't established at any Anywhere, then you realize you're back to square one. In the words of Richard Dawkins, <laughs> biology is the study of extremely complicated things that appear to have been designed by a creator for a purpose. The answer to your question, in other words, is that the creator did it. Um, I was just curious on what both of you believe that you're made up of. I mean. Do you believe that you have souls, or mm -hmm. do you believe that you um, are not spiritual beings, or I just wondered what you thought you are? Ah, uh, uh, well, uh, should I answer that to what I think Will is, or what I think I am? <laughs> <laughs> just teasing, Will. Uh, uh, the, uh, 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 you know, uh, I, I, I want to uh, answer it for organisms uh, rather than for uh, uh, even just human beings. I, I think that this is that one of the um, delusions that biology has been led into from this 19th century science that uh, Will uh, defend so uh, vigorously 
um, is the notion that what life is, is it's matter evolving by chance and natural selection. So the, the thing is, it's the material. It's a Kornberg's error, too, that it's the biochemistry makes it. I, I don't think that that's the case. I think that what makes life life is the information. Uh, just in the way, the analogy here is to a book. Um, if you have, if I have the plays of Shakespeare here, or even a more modest contribution like Darwin on trial, um, <laughs> the, uh, you cannot understand the, you don't know anything.